Philippians chapter 1 and verse 3. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. What is prayer? Anybody like to uh, posit a... A response, what is prayer? Yes. Talking to God. Talking to God, thank you. Listening to God. Listening to God, thank you. Building a relationship with God. Building a relationship with God, yes. Yeah. Spending time with God. Spending time with God, yeah, thank you. Okay, Billy Graham once described prayer like this. As a way of life. Not just for use in cases of emergency. And he went on, make it a habit. So that when the need arises, you will be in practice. Somebody else made the point that prayer is simply talking to God. Like a friend. And should be the easiest thing we do each day. Many different interpretations, many different uh, grand ideas of what prayer is and what prayer might be and how prayer should be. But I wonder if, in the cold, hard reality of everyday stressful living, I wonder if you agree. How easy do we find it to pray? I mean, when life is tough, when life stinks... When those prayers for the rain to let up don't work and it's horrible and miserable outside. And it's pretty horrible and miserable inside as well. How easily do we pray and how comfortable are we in knowing what to pray when things are good and when things are hard. So over the last few weeks we've looked at this huge topic of prayer and I, de I deliberately started by emphasising who we pray to, with the intention of reminding us all, as if we should need reminding, of the incredible, amazing enormity of who God is. My hope was to try and get us all to grasp a renewed glimpse of just how much this fabulous God loves us. Do we know that God loves us today? Do you know that whatever you're going through, whatever you have been through, whatever distance you may feel from one another or from him, God loves us. God's love for us is so deep, so intense. He wants to bless us. He wants to pour out his love upon us. He wants us to recognize his love, to acknowledge his love, to be aware of his love. To celebrate his love. He loves us. He loves you. And crazily he loves me. He delights in hearing us. In speaking to us. In engaging with us. As his family in every way we possibly can. And this incredible relationship. Is what underpins any and 
should be every attempt to pray. This incredible relationship should encourage us whenever and however we do pray. So as we draw this series on prayer to a close, I want to ask today, what do we pray for? What do we pray for? And uh, this passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians can, I hope, help us. Look again at verse 9. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Think for a moment about somebody who is close to you. Someone you care about. Someone who matters. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe a friend. Or perhaps a colleague. But just quietly consider that person for a moment. And if you were to pray just one thing for that one person, I wonder what that one thing would be. As in your mind's eye, you're holding an image of that person. What's the one thing that you might pray for them? Well, depending on their circumstances, perhaps you'd pray for better job opportunities for that individual. Or maybe you'd pray for some uh, healing, physical healing, psychological healing, healing from pain if that person has an illness or a condition. Maybe your one prayer would be to simply ask God to keep that individual safe if they travel a lot or if they travel or live in a dangerous place. Or do you pray for them to know peace in the context of a frantic situation that they find themselves in? The options are many, many and varied. And let me say there's nothing wrong in praying for any or all of those things. Asking for God's wisdom and help, compassion and mercy in all of these ways. But if you were only given a single point to pray, what would be of the highest priority? What would be the thing that kind of overarches all the others? Well, in verse 9 of our reading, Paul gives his answer to the question, what's the one thing he would pray? Did you notice what he talks about? Love. Love. Love for God. Out of all the things that, that Paul could have prayed for the Philippian church, he could have prayed for their health, he could have prayed for their economy, he could have prayed for encouragement, he might have prayed for ease from persecution. But as they walk the, the path of faith, he first earnestly and intensely prays that they would love God. That they would love God with an abounding love. And in the midst of this fallen and lost existence, the Bible introduces us to a God who is holy. A God who is filled with wisdom. A God who is immeasurably powerful. A God who loves us. And Paul wants to drive that message home to the Philippians and through this letter to all of us. And the Bible invites us not just to, to, um, to hear about this God who loves us, but to know him. To know him. Out of the overflow of his joy and purpose, God created us. God created 
uh, man and woman in his image. And his desire was that because of our knowledge of him and his creation, we would love him, we would obey him, we would honour him, we would trust him. But quickly into the, the biblical storyline, we see that the first man and woman decided to uh, reject their, their knowledge of God and instead to rebel against him. They, as human beings, wanted to be their own God, deciding for themselves what is right and what is wrong, discarding any knowledge, rebelling against God, throwing us all in every generation since into brokenness and corruption. We have been born into sin, fully saturated with sin. All the immense brokenness that we experience in our own hearts, those uh, offensive actions of others, the craziness of the world around, are consequences of a separated life from God, for which we all, to a greater or lesser extent, stand guilty as we uh, face up to God's desire and that could have been the end of the story but but Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 because of his great love because of his incredible amazing awesome all encompassing ever stretching eternal wonderful love I wish I could describe this love because of all the complexity of his love the passion of his love God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were still dead in our transgressions it is by grace <coughs> you have been saved so when we were living under the sentence of death when we were dead in our sins when we were unable because of our sin to reach out or uh, hear God properly he reached out to us he came running after us and in Christ he stood in our place to face the penalty and the punishment for our sins. That's how much he loves us. And that's the starting point of our salvation journey. God's incredible rescue plan for all of us. And Paul's prayer is that all his readers would know. This one who created us. Who freed us. Who loves us so intensely. But also Paul's prayer includes depth of insight. Not just knowledge, but depth of insight. Which will enable us to know God's will for us. What does God expect from me? What does God desire from me? As we grow in our knowledge, as we get deeper in our insight into who God is and why on earth he should love us. What does he want in return? How does he ask us to respond? Well, we have the commandments, so that's a helpful start. But many, uh, many of us assume that the commandments are kind of checklists. One of those boring lists of all the tasks that we've got to accomplish, all the rules which curb our freedom. But what if we looked at God's commandments in a different way? What if we recognised that God's commandments could be a network of safe paths that our Father in Heaven has laid out for us to protect us, to provide for us? What if we saw them as, uh, as uh, loving instructions from a Creator who actually knows what's best for His creation? What if we saw them as ways to help us better understand the character of this God, this Father God? And that depth of insight brings that kind of awareness of God's will for us, which 
combined with knowledge, helps us to abound in love for him. Verse 9, Philippians chapter 1. This is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And in turn, this helps us into verse 10 to discover a sincere love as we discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Do you feel very pure? Do you feel blameless? One day we will be. One day we will be. That's what this is promising. That as we discern what is best. We may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Made pure and blameless. Not by us. Not by our good works. Not by our wonderful appearance. But by Christ. We live in a time when reflective thinking isn't encouraged. We occupy ourselves with so many things. Don't we? Including uh, our phones. There's so many things at any time to kind of stop and ponder and reflect and think and contemplate and marvel. Any, we, we don't have any time, we don't allow any time to evaluate our choices, to carefully consider the decisions in our lives. All of that can be so easily squeezed out of, of life and reality. But friends, every single day... Every day we make hundreds of choices. And every one of those choices carries implications. Many of those choices carry implications for our relationship to God. Let me give you some examples. How should I respond to my spouse? What should I say in this situation or that? What job should I do? How do I respond to a boss who's being unkind. How do I deal with my temptations? What shall I do at church? Shall I even go to church? What shall I watch on the TV? What do I focus on on the internet? Each of our choices has a spiritual value and impact. So let me take the job question uh, as an easy example. When, usually when we think or when people think about another job, perhaps the priority is to think about the pay scale or, or the convenience. It'll be much easier to get to. I won't need to travel. Oh, I could work from home. Praise the Lord for Zoom. But as a believer, maybe we should be asking different questions. We need to understand our heart's motivation. Will this job hurt or help my witness for Jesus? Is my identity rooted in this job or elsewhere? <clears throat> Am I seeking the approval of man by taking or not taking this role or by continuing in it? Just examples, but the same kind of thought process and prayer attention relates to our relationships, our temptations, our activities. So many of our decisions and choices have that kind of moral implication. Where is Christ in our choices? You see, God's desire for us is that we should examine these decisions and choices and lovingly obey him. But why is it that we find ourselves on many occasions, in many situations, choosing uh, ourselves and even our sins instead of God? Actually, what I really want from this job is the pay. I can be rich. I can be wealthy. I can be happy. Rather than, is this what God wants me to do. In all of our choices, 
The big question we need to ask ourselves honestly is this. Am I loving God? Am I loving God in the way I choose? And as big and weighty as this question is, verse 10 of our reading hits us with a more substantial question. How can someone like me in my frailty and my weakness and my sin be possibly pure and blameless for the day of Christ? Well, there's so many answers to that question. But I think part of the answer relates to the next verse as we consider that abounding love and sincere love leads to exalting love. You see, Paul in verse 11 urges us to be filled with the, righteous, the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise, the exaltation of God. You see, our amazing, awesome, incredible, unbelievable God takes it upon himself to assure and establish us so that on the day of Christ, all who have trusted in Christ will be filled with the fruit of righteousness. And this is not our own righteousness. Uh, Paul is not talking about our good works, our accomplishments, the, the medals we win, the uh, good and faithful employer of the month awards we get. Paul's not talking about things like that. These are all like filthy rags, he describes somewhere else. Paul here is talking about the righteousness that comes only through Christ. Only by accepting Christ, by clothing ourselves in Christ, can we achieve this righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5, he, Paul says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Because of our sin. It had little to do with Roman soldiers and nails and crowns of thorns. It was our sin that took him there. Why? So that when he was resurrected, we would know the reality of the righteousness of God. In, uh, verse, uh, in these verses, verse 9 starts, and this is my prayer. The word translated as prayer here means supplication. It conveys a sense of begging, earnestly pleading, sweat drops of blood, if you like. Paul's making his prayer with such great intensity of gut-wrenching earnestness, which kind of conveys or betrays the sense of urgency that he has. And we do well to notice that intensity, to notice his priority, that the love they already carry, Paul's acknowledged that they are already uh, children of God who carry love, but that that love will abound or increase or accelerate or, or burst out more and more and more. How does that happen? How does our love for God abound more? How does it increase? By knowledge and depth of insight. Knowledge is about getting to know God through his word and through the example of Jesus. Knowing God is very different from knowing about God. Knowledge in the Bible always implies this close, intimate relationship which comes through a personal connection, a warm fellowship with him. And the more we know God through his word, the more we'll grow in our love and appreciation for him. John's first letter makes that clear. We love because he first loved us. And the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is God's love story for a people 
that are broken and lost. Sinners like you and me have hope by trusting in God through Christ. We, you and I, can be filled with this fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. So, how do we pray? How does all this, what does all this abounding, sincere and exalting love do in our hearts? How does that shape what we pray? When we see that Jesus laid down his life for us, to give us his righteousness, putting us right with God. When we see the Holy Spirit working in us, when we see our Father holding on to us, no matter how much we've tried to run away, we see a love which produces great eternal hope, which should make us want to repent of our sins and rely again on him. How can we run away from our God? How can we not yearn for that closeness, that intensity of abounding love, more and more and more and more of him? So in thinking about prayer, we've kind of come full circle. We started off by thinking about who we pray for. And now we're thinking about what we pray. We pray uh, sorry who we pray to we pray to the one who created us the one who loves us the one who looked uh, at the world and decided there's something missing i know you uh, and you and the world needs one of you and that accelerates and kind of flourishes throughout the world God's love for us is just so immense and so intense. But because of that love, because he's poured out all this love, as a, as a result of his love, as a desire of his love, as a, as a dream of his love, he's asking us to love him. And we show our love for him by praying to him, by engaging with him, by listening to him, by sitting quietly with him by shouting at him by dancing sometimes yes but by mourning as well because we're in the presence of a God whose love for us is more than we can ever imagine so much more than we can ever comprehend and what do we pray for we pray that we might know that love more and more and that such love will be poured out to others. As we pray for other people, as you think about that individual you thought about earlier, what do we pray for? Let's pray that they might know God, that they might know God's love, that they might fall so much in love with him that they can't stop. And that we can't stop. And that we just go on and on and on declaring our love. Proclaiming his love. And confessing our love for him. Let's pray now. Every moment of every day is a new opportunity to set our prayers our requests, our frustrations, our fears before the Lord. We can pray morning, evening and any time in between. We can pray alone, we can pray in groups, we can pray as a nation, we can pray as a world. We can pray aloud. We can pray silently. We can pray in any and every language, including those that nobody else 
understands. We can pray with words or groans. We can pray with tears, wordless tears. But whatever we pray, however we pray, please let's pray. And let us allow the truth of scripture, the example of Jesus, to fuel and inform us as we pray. Father God, you know our hearts. You know our desires. You know our love. Please would you help us to love you more. To praise you more. To lean into you more. And to know the power of you more. Help us, Lord, to be aware of the measure of your love, that we might share that love with others, an abounding, sincere, exalting love for others. Amen.